How many people in the room have been to Plum Island? Oh, I would say about a thir third to a half. That's good, okay. Um, how many are signed up to go this year on a trip? One, okay. Well, um, what I'm going to do is show you a film first that was put on by a group called Visionaries. And Visionaries is a group that creates films for public television. This film was already shown on public television in Connecticut, and soon it's going to be on public television in East Hampton. And we're hoping to get it onto Channel 13 and LIW 21. If anybody has contacts there, please let me know, because we'd really like to get it on there. But in the meantime, this nonprofit group called Visionaries has allowed us to use this film to help us in the campaign to save Plum Island. And I think it has a really good introduction to the whole um, issue about Plum Island. And once we've seen the film, I will take you on a little visual, uh, virtual tour uh, by PowerPoint of Plum Island and talk about some of the resources there. And I hope all of this that I show you today will get you excited about the cause and that you will want to join us. You'll learn about the Preserve Plum Island Coalition in the film, and I'll be talking about that some more at the end. John Turner is here. He's the spokesperson for the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. And we have a volunteer here today from Save the Sound, uh, Sheila Meehan. Raise your hand, Sheila. She also um, is going to have, uh, if you haven't already signed it, a petition. And she can pass it around the room uh, during the film. And you can decide, if you haven't signed it yet, whether you'd like to. Visionary is proud to present his 21st season on public television. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news, and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. Sorry you can't hear it very well. But you know what? It's just not true. can hold on to something. There's something, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. Sorry about the this sound. It's Every not child usual. has potential that we so just can't know. That. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. one of the most environmentally important pieces of land on the East Coast. Over our shoulder here is Plum Island, and it is at the very tip of the North Fork of Long Island, just about a mile and a half off of Orient Point. We're going straight through the gut, which is, uh, can be a very good fishing place. It also can be a treacherous and rough place because you have very swift currents here, up to four and five knots at some times. Its churning waters are alive with sea turtles, whales, and fish. This area supports some of the best fishing in the region. There's so few pristine places that have such critical habitat. Plum Island has everything from a freshwater marsh to rocky shore, and then you have seals and marine mammals and sea turtles who are migrating by as well. Peak of the width, you can see hundreds of seals that are either swimming in the water around the rocks here or hold out on the rocks. So if you come along Plum Island, you can see seals swimming like this harvest seal right here in front of us. It's really a gem in the Long Island Sound ecosystem to have this much of an island that is undeveloped, or at least relatively undeveloped, wild habitat for hundreds of different species of birds. To give you some context, people have been coming out here conducting bird censuses on a monthly basis for a number of years now. And they've documented, as of October of 2015, 219 species of birds. Most of this three-mile-long island has remained largely untouched 
Its habitat provides refuge for migrating birds, the threatened piping plover and the endangered roseate tern. The good news is we, the people, already own it. The bad news is the government wants to auction it off to the highest bidder. And the threat to these unique wild lands is real and immediate. We're here because of what could happen to this island in the very near future of it being sold and sold to the highest bidder, a developer that could destroy the island. There is hope. Save the Sound and 65 other groups formed the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. If it was just one person individually trying to protect something like Plum Island, it would never get anywhere. But by putting together all of these entities, that's where you can have real power, and that's where you can have real social change, and a whole group of individuals who might not ever otherwise come together, come together for a cause and share their passion. It, along with thousands of citizens, are fighting to protect our land. Now all we have to do is to get the government to listen. I see the government as nothing more than an, a student who needs to be educated. We are educating the government on what the ecological importance is, historical importance is, as well as what the general public wants. State Assemblyman Steve Engelbright has called this public hearing as a way to gather a consensus on how to handle this and how to, to see who's interested in preserving Plum Island. Plum Island is Yes, an important singular island into itself, but it's part of an ecosystem, an ecosystem that the state has already recognized as being important in law. These three islands, Plum Island, Great Gull, and Little Gull, are an interlocking ecosystem. They work together. Interconnectivity is really a critical concept to understand in ecology because there are very few places out there that function in a vacuum. And uh, Plum Island is actually part of an important bird area as a complex. I'll give you an example. Great Gull Island, that is the most important spot in the world for common terns where they breed. 9,000 pairs of common terns bred there last year in 2014. Without adequate foraging areas, those birds would not be able to feed their chicks. They need to fly offshore to sand lance, amidite is a type of small fish, that they can bring back and feed their young. 1,300 pairs of endangered roseate terns bred on Great Gull Island. And then, when they have their fledglings, they will fly over to Plum Island. And there, they will raise their fledglings. They will forage around the island where there's a lot of bait fish and a lot of marine life. To order it sold as if it's a piece of meat is something that I was very disappointed to learn about uh, that our distinguished colleagues did in Washington. Heroes fading in a lost nation with no priorities. Congress voted to sell the island and to use the the proceeds of the sale to build a new uh, animal research facility. So if you look at the island, over here's the eastern end and we're going over to the western end. The white buildings that you see here are part of the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Due to the fact that you've got the Plum Island Animal Disease Center on the island, and because of that, there is not currently any real public access that's allowed. As a result, you have species of wildlife that actually concentrate in fairly large numbers. The island is owned by the federal government, and it's run by the Department of Homeland Security. When the federal government decided to sell it, it was a shock to the community, and I live in Southold, and I was on Southold Town Board at the time. The law was passed in 2009. It doesn't state it has to be sold to the highest bidder. It says it has to be sold in a public sale taking into consideration important governmental interests. While the GSA and Department of Homeland Security have repeatedly claimed any conservation options were out of their hands, the truth is congressional language offers the agencies multiple levels of discretion. So based on this language, it's clear that one, GSA and the Department of Homeland Security can effectuate a conservation sale, one that sells a portion of the island that the facility is located on while conserving 600 plus acres of open space. Many of us often say that this is exactly the type of property that we would all be clamoring to acquire as open space. The beauty of this situation is that we the people already own it. We only need our federal government to stop going out of its way to divest us of this public trust property. Supreme irony here is that we the people already own this island. We've owned it for over a century. 
Now, an agency is taking the most conservative bureaucratic view it possibly can to sell it without taking into consideration the ecological treasures out there, the conservation value. There's a land that can hear it speaking. There are roots and their descendants seeking. The history of Plum Island originates with the Native Americans, particularly Pequots, over in Connecticut, using it as a storehouse for food. It eventually went to two families, the Beebe family and the Skellinger family. They started splitting up the farms among their descendants. Finally, with the Spanish-American War starting up, the Army Corps of Engineers took over parts of all the long chain of islands that Plum Island belongs to, and they built a series of forts. So we're now coming up on what we call the parade grounds area of Plum Island. That also is where the barracks, the former uh, Fort Terry. That was there from about 1898 all the way down to World War II. One of the cultural assets of Plum Island is the remains of, of Fort Terry that were built during the Spanish-American War to try to ensure the protection of New York Harbor. By the time we get to World War II, they say, all right, everything is outdated. We don't want it anymore. And so the Department of Agriculture took over the entire island to use it for hoof and mouth disease. Save the Sand and the wider coalition of, of all kinds of folks, from EPA and Department of Interior on down to many, many, many local groups and townships are all saying the same thing together, which is an important governmental interest is, in fact, preserving the unique ecological treasure that Plum Island stands for. The message is if the federal government is not interested in running a research facility here, then they should either put it into a park system or they should give it to the town of Southold who will manage it. In a perfect world, what we'd like to see happen is that the 80% portion of the island, 600 plus acres, that has been left undisturbed for the last 70 years, we would like to see that conserved and transferred to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or another agency and protected. And we would like to see the 20% of the island that currently is occupied by the Plum Island Animal Disease Center adaptively reused in order to keep the jobs. Those are important too. Uh, good afternoon, Assemblyman. My name is Adrian Esposito. I'm the Executive Director of Citizens Campaign for the Environment. I'm not going to talk about all the environmental assets. We have New York State Audubon here is going to do that. We have Randy from the Nature Conservancy. We have John Turner, a famous naturalist. They're going to tell you about the ecological assets of the island. I want to just focus on the public will. This is exactly the type of land we've been buying for the last 25 years. This is exactly the type of land the public has voted again and again and again in asking us to preserve. Simply put, the island is magnificent. The public wants this type of preservation. And the best news about this island is we don't have to buy this island. We already own this island. All we have to do is continue to do that. I'm going to let the credits roll because this was done by a nonprofit and they deserve some credit. But the sound went off well. The credits will roll. OK, so. Oh. Get to your PowerPoint, I'll, I'll convert you over. OK, thanks. Um, my, where's my flash drive? Is it in that? Can, okay. can I just pull it? You do whatever you think you want to do. Almost done. <laughs> you could see there were a lot of contributors. <laughs> Just like public television. Watch public television while you can. <laughs> right? Even if it's on my computer. Numbers get, the letters get smaller depending on how much money you give. <laughs> okay.
There we go. All right. Thank you. Now, um, while we're setting up, you're good. So you can just go to that. Um, this? At this point, can we do the extend on this? The uh, extended it's screen. Gonna, it should show up here. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take this off. Um, while we're setting up, uh, Sheila Meehan, our volunteer, is going to pass around um, a petition. If you haven't signed it out at our table um, and you'd like to, it's going to be moving around the room. This is just the forward. Yeah, I'm trying to get the screen back up. It looks, it looks like it's back. Yeah, this is, this that's is forward, forward and that's back. The one that gets more well used. Isn't Tim great? He should have gotten a lot more applause than he got earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've seen him do this every year for people who have all kinds of different electronic and uh, oh, that's what I didn't, I didn't digital know. issues. Yep, yep. Now you can see it. Okay. And, <laughs> and so you can use this and just forward back. They'll show you your notes. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to take you on what we call a virtual tour of Plum Island. And um, because of all the uh, work you've been doing the last couple of days watching all the fine presentations, I know your mind is on biology. I will also be showing you a little bit of, well, and geology and all kinds of things from the uh, natural history. But I'll be also showing you some historical and cultural things on Plum Island. Um, but as Patrick Commons was describing in the film about the interconnectivity, you might want to think about that as the film goes forward and why I'm calling it the biological linchpin of an archipelago. So if this scene, which was taken off of the Cross Sound Ferry, is at all familiar to you, um, I think, and if that's as close as you've gotten to Plum Island, I think we have a treat for you. Um, so with the help of Google Earth, um, we can get a satellite view of where Plum Island is in our region and zoom down for a closer look, which I'm skipping because we're going to zoom down later. You can see where it is in relation to Orient Point, Great Gull, Little Gull, and Fisher's Island. And in this chain of island, islands, um, the archipelago continues on to Napa Tree Point in Rhode Island, off uh, part of Watch Hill. It's part of the Harbor Hill Moraine. Um, formed during the retreat of the second advance of the Wisconsin and Glacier. glacier. Um, here is where the waters of Long Island Sound and Peconic Bay, Gardner's Bay, and Block Island Sound come together. The turbulent waters around these islands in this archipelago are owned by New York State. Those are all New York State waters, except the parts that were within the uh, jurisdiction of, of Connecticut and Rhode Island. The deep straits between the islands are challenging to mariners to the point that they've received their own names. Now, Plum Gut is officially designated by New York State as a significant coastal fish and wildlife habitat for its extremely rich marine life. It's um, a favorite place for fishermen. And on any day, if you take that cross aisle, Cross Sound Ferry over to New London. You'll see lots of fishing boats there. So now we're going to take a closer look at the object of our desires. At the far western end of the island is the structure uh, perhaps most familiar to you. Um, this is supposed to zoom in. I'm not sure why it isn't. Well, we'll forget the zoom. But um, that's the western end. Oh, now we're zooming in. <laughs> yeah. All you have to do is walk toward the screen, and it cooperates. Um, and it's now ahead of my notes, so I will do what I can. Uh, this is called Sandy Point. And if you look at the far end over there, you may see a man standing. Um, that's part of the lookout. You know there's a lot of security around Plum Island. Plum Island is rich in natural ecological communities, including five that are considered significant by the New York Natural Heritage Program. Maritime Beach, Maritime Dunes, 
Maritime Bluff, um, and Maritime Rocky intertidal communities. Kind of walk toward, will it zoom in for me? No. Uh, the, the unusual stripy area we'll go to next that you can see in the um, lower part of the island there is a large freshwater wetland. It's an important source of fresh water for the island's animals. As you might imagine, since the island's surrounded by salt water and is supportive of numerous wetland plant communities. It's a 96 acre freshwater wetland that we're only now beginning to study. Much more work needs to be done to understand this gorgeous natural feature of the island. That's correct. And now we'll go to the place you've heard about, whether or not you've been there, the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. And if you visit the island, you'll spend about an hour and a half there listening to a presentation about their work. Research began there in 1952 in the building uh, now known as Lab 257, which is not shown in this picture. Now this facility does research of worldwide importance. It, they study foot and mouth disease and swine fever. The work at the lab protects our food supply and it involves top scientists from around the world, all doing important work on animal diseases. The lab also is a center for creating and maintaining important vaccines that protect livestock everywhere. It employs over 400 people from Long Island as well as Connecticut. It's due to be closed somewhere between 2020 and 2022, where, when the operation will be moved to Manhattan, Kansas. There, a new fully funded Level four facility is being built. Level four facilities can study zoonotic diseases, those that can jump from animals to humans. The Plum Island Animal Disease Center is a level three, which studies only those diseases that are contagious among animals other than humans. Now we're traveling to the eastern end of the island where elements of the previous U.S. military operations still remain, as you heard John talking about in the movie. Because of Plum Island's strategic location at the entrance to Gardner's Bay and through Plum Gut to Long Island Sound, and thus to New York City and its environs, Fort Terry was established in 1897 as part of America's ambitious plan to enhance its coastal defenses particularly arising from the fears surrounding the Spanish-American War. And although no Spanish-American uh, invasion materialized, um, the building of forts in this region continued. Several buildings still stand, adjoining a wide open field that John described to you in the film as the parade grounds, and which is part of the island they still kept mown today to keep it open. By the way, these rather gorgeous photographs were taken by a name, uh, gentleman named Bob Lorenz, and he donated these pictures um, for our use at Save the Sound. Not all of the pictures, but the more beautiful ones. After Fort Terry was abandoned, human use of the island was limited to small areas on the island, and so nature rebounded. And now the island provides refuge for scores of species and communities of conservation concern. A four season study, in other words, a study taking place in winter, spring, summer, and fall, was conducted in 2015. And a report was released in June of 2016 by the New York Natural Heritage Program. If you stopped at our table in one of the last couple of days, you might have seen a purple report, purple cover, um, that Sheila may have let you look at. And you can download that report uh, from the New York Natural Heritage Program. And I believe there's a copy, uh, a downloadable file available on the Long Island uh, Nature Organization website as well. 
So among the natural return, uh, communities that are returning, maritime shrubland is returning, providing a uh, great habitat for numerous species, including um, the northern harry. Harry are a species of greatest conservation need, which is believed to actually be breeding on the island. About 16 rare plants are known historically on Plum Island. It's the highest concentration of rare plants in the state, second only to Fisher's Island right nearby. Six species on the island are endangered. Spring ladies tresses that you see here, a rare orchid. Orchid was found on the island in the largest population known in New York State. Uh, now, when they went to look for them in 2015, they thought that the numbers had dropped significantly, but they're still there. And heritage scientists suggest that more might be found and conserved if there was more active management of the island's natural resources. Another uh, exploitably vul vulnerable plant found in New York, uh, the wild pink. All along the southern shore of the island, we have these gorgeous high bluffs. And if I move towards the screen, it's going to do something. Okay. It's also supposed to move for us. Um, as, as much as 70, 70 feet high, in places, these bluffs. And you can see the holes in the top there. You probably, if you're a birder, you know what they are, or just a Long Island naturalist. The, the holes are made by bank swallows for their nests, another species of greatest conservation need in New York. Now this was put together um, by Audubon New York and taking into account some of the information they've compiled as well as from the New York Natural Heritage Program. And as you can see, of the 215 species, 57 of them are at risk, 63 of them are breeders. And between the two of those, there are 13 breeding at-risk species on Plum Island. You could probably identify what they are. You have the harrier, the black duck, common eider. I guess that's a common tern, correct me if I'm wrong. A um, American oyster catcher, American bittern, piping plover, and which tern is that? Rosie at the bottom, thank you. Rosie in the middle and at the bottom. Common tern, says John, I believe him. <laughs> so using data <clears throat> from a paper written in the 1980s by Buckley and Buckley and New York State DEC's Long Island Colonial Waterbird Survey. The New York Natural Heritage Program made these graphs, <clears throat> which they allowed me to use for this purpose, to show the declines in the wading birds um, shown here, the snowy egret, the great egret, glossy ibis, and the black-crowned night heron on Plum Island over the last 30 or so decades. Plum Island was first documented as a major heron rookery and seabird breeding colony in the 1970s, when up to 26 pairs of great egret, 135 pairs of snowy egret, 45 pairs of black crowned night heron, and 10 pairs of glossy ibis, two pairs of little blue heron, and one pair of tricolored tri heron were recorded. As you can tell by the graphs, the numbers are going down. And the Heritage Program believes they found the culprit. Uh, it's believed that a raccoon, it's a raccoon. Uh, it's believed that a raccoon stowed away somehow onto the island, uh, possibly a pregnant one, and now the island has a lot of raccoons. And there's been some moderate effort at eradicating them, but it has not succeeded, and more needs to be done. Uh, they're, they're very good at hiding in the underbrush and all the places that Plum Island now has, has grown wild into. But what we all love about Plum Island, and who couldn't? The seals. Oh, those beautiful seals in great numbers. Harbor seals. Plum Island is the home of the largest winter seal haul out in New York State and among the largest in southern New England. 
If you've been on any of the Cressley walks down at Cupsog County Park, you've seen maybe 60, 80, possibly 100 in a day. Plum Island has a haul out where in the last few years in the winter there have been over 900 seals. So it's almost an order of magnitude greater. So uh, these have been detected in regular flyovers by the Riverhead Foundation for Marine Re uh, Preservation and Research and, and the numbers seem to be growing. The harbor seals are actually having pups at Plum Island. At least one pup has been seen. Um, and it's believed that the isolation from people is the key to that because harbor seals are skittish and what scientists know is that they will abandon their young if people um, come around. So if they feel harassed, they'll abandon their young. And this pup was surviving. The beaches around Plum Island have basically been in, untouched since World War II. And the Heritage Program tells us that makes it a potential home to the threatened American burial be uh, burying beetle, which cannot take compaction of the sand, which would happen with a lot of foot traffic. There's a little foot traffic here, not much. It's also, of course, an important place for the endangered piping plover, which nests on these beaches. The northern right whale has been spotted off of Plum Island, and harbor porpoises have been seen there more and more frequently in the waters around Plum Island. Submerged aquatic vegetation, like beds of eelgrass, provide important marine and estuarine habitat for, for many important fish, crustaceans, and shellfish unfortunately are becoming more rare nowadays, hard to restore. Green sea turtles require seagrass beds like the ones off Plum Island for foraging. Five species of sea turtles, all federally listed, have the potential to be found in the waters around Plum Island. The endangered Kemp's Ridley sea turtle has been found around Orient Point and in Plum Gut. Uh, Byron Young, who some of you may know, said that he saw a green turtle there, I think, in the 1970s. Sea turtles are hard to study, and they're especially hard to detect when they're juveniles. Loggerheads and uh, Kemp's Ridley are attracted uh, to areas with eelgrass because these areas, in turn, are rich with crabs, which they eat. The final environmental impact statement for the sale of Plum Island states that the Atlantic hawksbill and the leatherback turtles, oh, this is a leatherback, um, are likely in the waters around Plum Island. We're not sure where they got that information, but we'll take it. Nothing says interconnected, interconnectedness, like Patrick Cummins said, like the relationships between the birds, the fish they eat, and the three islands of Plum, Great Gull, and Little Gull. The endangered roseate tern nests on nearby Great Gull Island in large numbers and uses Plum Island and its surrounding waters for foraging, resting, and training their young. Now, why did I call, say that Plum Island was the, the biological linchpin of this archipelago or a group of islands? Well, the old-fashioned uh, definition of a linchpin was a pin that you would pl place across through, or through an axle to keep a wheel in its position. Nowadays, we say it's a thing that's essential for, or for coordinating other things, or the most important member of a group or part of a system that holds together the other parts. That's how I see Plum Island, and I hope that you will too. Right next door is Great Gull Island, formerly Fort Mikey. It's owned by the American Museum of Natural History and is devoted to bird conservation. Here you can see David Sibley, the author of probably the, the field guide that you like very much on birds, uh, and many other bird references um, for the National Audubon Society, is volunteering his time to uh, paint the sign and keep the place in good order. The principal researcher on this, the 17 acre island is Helen Hayes. She's been there for 47 years studying, and she's world-renowned by the bird conservation community. 9,500 common terns, the biggest colony in the world, 1,300 endangered roseate terns, the biggest in the Western Hemisphere, forage for bay anchovies, small herring, and sand eels. 
Great Gull is a New York State designated significant coastal fish and wildlife habitat. When you're looking down this path, you're looking um, east. And this is the view west from Great Gull back to Plum. You can see it's not really that far. Not for a bird. Little Gull Island, which you can see in the distance here, that looks like simply a lighthouse. That was sold for $325,000 recently to one guy, a resident of Connecticut, surprisingly named Mr. Plum. Interconnected. <laughs> the New London Maritime Society tried to buy it, um, but they, being a nonprofit, could only bid at fair market value and were outbid by Mr. Plum. Little Gull Island, in the distance, is becoming a critically important habitat for gray seals. They're common there now, although only in the last 40 years. Again, as the military leaves, the animals come back. Seals from Gr Little Gull also haul out at Great Gull. It seems they're having pups around Little Gull and Great Gull. That's the gray seals. Uh, researchers have seen mixed groups of harbor and gray seals on Plum Island. Again, interconnectivity. The US Fish and Wildlife Service has identified the islands of Plum, Great Gull, and Little Gull, and Fishers Island as being within a significant coastal habitat that they call the Orient Point Islands Complex. Plum Island has numerous designations from federal and state governments. It lies within the boundaries of two estuaries of national significance, uh, important in the National Estuaries Program. Its entire shoreline is designated a coastal erosion hazard area. It lies within the Eastern Islands Regionally Important Natural Area and is a stewardship area in the Long Island Sound Study National Estuary Program. This is a view from the east end of Plum Island looking back toward Orient Point. And yet, with all this recognition, the future of Plum Island is uncertain. As you heard in the movie, in 2009, this language was slipped into an omnibus appropriations bill, a big fat document which senators and congressmen may not read every sentence of. They got two sentences in that changed our world with regard to Plum Island that the secretary, meaning the secretary of uh, defense, shall liquidate, sell, the Plum Island asset through public sale, all personal property assets which support Plum Island operations subject to such terms and conditions as necessary to protect the government interests and meet program requirements. We put in italics some language that we think is rather key. We don't think that it's necessary to protect the government interests to leave a good deal of Plum Island undisturbed and to sell a smaller portion of it. I'll talk, about, I'll talk more about that in a moment. But we have people who have envisioned this for Plum Island. And one of these people, who's a very major developer worldwide, has elevated himself into a very high office in our government. And thus came the creation of the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. And we have a mission statement to permanently protect the significant natural and cultural resources there, to protect the undeveloped acreage, about 80% of the island as a national wildlife refuge, or a preserve of equal value, and that if we cannot <clears throat> reuse the facility at the Plum Island Animal Disease Center, that maybe we should take those buildings out, clean up the area, and create the entire island um, as a national wildlife refuge. But we agree with the town of Southhold that it's important to keep the jobs there, and we would like to see the area adaptable, adaptively reused. This is the town of Southhold's zoning map, and the West End, where it says Plum Island Research District, is a brand new, unique zoning district for 20% of the island. 
which contains all the necessary infrastructure for keeping the lab going. The rest of the island, which contains the former military installations and all the wild lands that are rebounding, 80% of the island is now held in a conservation district, according to the town. If you follow things like land use, you know that a town cannot zone a federal property. So these, these zones exist in law and do not take effect until such time that the island is sold out of public ownership. And of course, we're trying to avoid that happening. So we have a three-step plan. First, we'd like to see the federal government retain Plum Island. As you heard in the movie, we already own it. There's no need to buy it. We'd like to see it transferred to perhaps the US Fish and Wildlife Service, perhaps the National Park Service, perhaps a combination type of an arrangement. If you've ever been to Governor's Island off the tip of Manhattan, that's a success story where it, a former military operation was turned over actually to the city of New York. And now it serves a very good purpose for what it can do best off the tip of Manhattan. At the other end of southeastern New York is Plum Island, which should serve its best purpose, in my view, as wildlife habitat. So we have gone to the federal government with litigation. Save the Sound, Group for the East End, Peconic Baykeeper, um, and forgive me if I've forgotten the name of another group that you're in um, that's joined in the litigation. There are also some individuals who've joined in. And we're saying we have seven, po seven points um, of causes of action for this litigation. And we are mainly pointing out that the EIS was inadequate. It did not consider um, the effects of the sale on endangered species. It did a very poor job of looking at how the island should be remediated. It did a very poor job of figuring out what the natural resources were on the island and the impacts on the natural resources. Uh, there's uh, four other causes of action, and um, we did file last July. We got a motion to dismiss in January. We responded to that, and um, now things are rolling forward again. So that litigation is underway. That hopefully just gets the feds to the table. We're also working with Congress and the Senate to come up with language to undo that silly set of two sentences in the appropriations bill of 2009 that said we should sell this island. The Plum Island Animal Disease Center cannot, the whole island can't raise enough money to build the new facility in Manhattan, Kansas, and it's no longer needed. The new facility in Manhattan, Kansas has been fully funded. So there's no longer a need to sell the island for this purpose, if there ever was. We'd like to see the language change, and we're actively working with Senate senators and congressmen about that. We also have New York State strategies. We started a couple of years ago meeting with different agencies in the state. As you could see in the movie, um, we had S Assemblyman Engelbright had a hearing, and many people came forward and gave a lot of good information on that. And last year, Assemblyman Engelbright and Senator Laval and others uh, co-sponsored a legislation to protect areas around those three islands for the marine mammals and sea turtles that uh, passed the assembly, failed in the Senate, um, but we are looking at other kinds of legislation basically to bring attention to Plum Island. And the more we can keep it in the news, the more we can keep people engaged, the better our chances of moving our elected officials into the right direction. We also this year are trying to go and visit with Andrew Cuomo. If you filled out one of our postcards that were out at the table, thank you. Those are going to go to Andrew Cuomo, asking him to use the powers of New York State's coastal program. New York State's coastal management program actually has enough power based on the CZMA, the Coastal Zone Management Act of, of the United States, given to the states the states have the power to say no to certain federal actions that are not consistent with New York's coastal policies. That power was used to stop Broadwater in Long Island Sound. You may remember that battle. That, that power is being used now 
to fight the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers for dumping dredge spoil in eastern Long Island Sound. And Governor Cuomo is using that law to fight that battle. We are going to ask him this year to do it again for Plum Island and to say, no, it's against the policies of the state of New York for the federal government to sell public land in our coastal area. It should remain public. And that's what we're going for this year. And your postcards, if you haven't filled them out, we have more. And we can get your organizations more, OK? So we have a way to do that. We'd like to flood the governor with postcards. And we're setting up meetings with him for this spring. And then there's you. We need your partnerships. If you're not already members of the coalition, and I suspect many of your organizations are, you can join as an individual. Or you may have another organization that would like to join. All you need to do is agree to our mission statement, which you saw earlier. And you can also see on the website, preserveplumisland.org. We, we need you to help us organize, to get the media more involved, to show up at rallies, things like that, get, getting the word out. We really could use your help, and we hope you can join. Now, if you would like to know more and stay on uh, Save the Sounds updates uh, for Plum, and you have a cell phone, you can do this right now. Text Plum, just the word Plum, to 22828. And it, you'll get a response that says, may I have your email address? And then you type that in, and you will be in the system to get all the updates on Plum Island. Anything that Save the Sound can tell you, we will. You can also get tons of information about the coalition from preserveplumisland.org. I encourage you, because of your particular interests, to go to the Plum Island Biodiversity Report. You can take a look at a copy of it at our table outside. You can download a copy for yourself in PDF form. Wonderful book that we've had out there on display for the last couple of days by Ruth Ann Bramson, Jeff Fleming, and Amy Kasuga Folk, who you saw. You saw Amy in there talking about the Pequots in the movie. A World Unto Itself, The Remarkable History of Plum Island, New York, chock full of information. I don't know if anybody in this room has read the whole book yet. I haven't. It's, it's really thick with information. I guess you call that pithy. Um, it's produced by the South Hold Historical Society, and you can get it through them or ask your librarian to order it. Savethesound.org, we of course have a, a page on Plum Island, can keep you up to date. You can always contact me, there's my email address, or call me, my business cards are outside as well. So thank you for listening to this. Um, I know John's here can help answer questions as well, as if you have any. All of these people that I've listed here have been essential for creating this presentation today, including visionaries, which I did not list. And um, thank you for listening. Okay, we are at the end, uh, but we can take a minute or two for questions if, if there are any. Everybody's very well informed. <laughs> Go ahead. The uh, Natural Heritage Program maintains a rare plant status list. Correct. Has there been an inventory of Plum Island to see which of those plants is on the island? Yes, and it, you can see the results in, in the um, biodiversity report that I mentioned. And it lists exactly which ones they expected to find there based on literature reviews. That was published by the Nature Conservancy in 2012. And when they went back in 2015, they actually looked for all of the things they expected might be there. And those are all listed in the report. And there's a copy of the report on our table. And you can also download a PDF of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Louise.